Amen. Let's thank Joel for leading us into the presence of God tonight. Thanks for being here, you guys. We're glad to have you here. Thanks to everybody who's watching online. I've been chatting with a bunch of you uh, already. Don't forget to share uh, this on your page so that others can see it as well. Help us extend our reach. We're so glad that you guys are here. Don't forget there's uh, three ways to support the church financially. Number one, you can give using the Yay God boxes that are out in the lobby, or you can send it to the website address you see on your screens, or you can send a check to the P.O. Box, all three of those equally valid ways and helpful ways to support the ministries of the church financially. Every single penny helps, so mahalo for whatever you can share. Well, we're in this 10-part Wednesday night series right now. Tonight's actually part 10, the finish of this series, then we're going to do a Thanksgiving-themed message next Wednesday, and then we're going to go into some Advent Christmas messages, and then we're going to go into some core values messages. We've got the next uh, three or four months planned out, and we're excited about where we're going with those. So tonight we're talking about kaleo. Kaleo in Greek means to call to someone with your voice, to call them to action or an office, or a purpose, and in Alelo Hawaii, the Hawaiian language, it is a male name that translates as the voice, or the sound, into English. So it's just very interesting to me that these two languages, uh, created very far distance apart, very different times, uh, spell the word the same, pronounce the word in similar ways, and they both have to do with a voice or a call to action. So it's just kind of a neat thing how God uh, sort of creates languages around similar themes. So we're talking about several callings of God, several ways the voice of God calls us to action. We're calling it the kaleo of akua, the calling of God. And so far we've talked about the first four callings of God, the first four kaleo of akua. We've said we are called to care. Second, we said we are called to worship. Third, we said we're all called to serve. And fourth, we said we are called to make disciples. And now tonight we're finishing up the second half of our fifth and final Kaleo of Akua. We are called to be holy. And there are, of course, more than five ways that God calls to us, of course. These are just the five I felt led to share with you at this time. But if you're ready to hear what God's put on my heart to share with you tonight, would you say or type, hit me with it, G, I'm ready. Or uh, Shotwell's told me they always say, him wigger, him wigger. So maybe a shorter way to say it. Uh, Last week I shared that there is a double focus of holy in the Bible. We said the first was that to be holy is to be unique. The word holy or sacred means separate, set apart, unique from anything and everything else. And only God, our creator, who existed before everything else, is truly holy. Then the second idea of this word holy has a purely moral focus. And of course, God, as the creator of everything, is the creator of morality. God is the definer of right and wrong. And there is such a thing as absolute truth. There is such a thing as absolute right. There is such a thing as absolute wrong. Uh, Our society says all morals are fluid or individualistic. That's not true. All morals are not fluid. And the second idea of what it means to be holy, then, is this. To be holy is to be absolutely pure. The sacred nature of holiness we talked about before, otherness, applies most specifically here in this realm of purity. Holiness is being set apart from anything impure in order to be completely given over to whatever God says is pure. Let me say that again. Holiness is being set apart from anything impure in order to be completely given over to what God says is pure. And so when you apply this message to God, his holiness points to what 1 John 1, 5 says. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him is how much darkness? No darkness. No darkness at all. Puritan pastor Stephen Charnock said it this way, As there is no darkness in his understanding, so there is no spot in his will. As his mind is possessed with all truth, so there is no deviation in his will from it. He loves all truth and goodness. He hates all falsity and evil. The Apostle Paul also reminds us of this holy nature of God. In Romans 1.18, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven 
against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Of course, talking about the wrath of God makes many modern Christians nervous. We prefer to focus on the love of God. And many of us feel the fatal, make the fatal mistake of assuming God's love for us makes him somehow unwilling to punish sin. Or worse yet, that God is okay with our sin, or that even God loves our sin. We don't want to be deceived. God does not love sin. God does not accept sin. God is utterly holy without any sin at all, and he will one day destroy all sin. And he calls us to be holy as he is holy. Theologian Jay Packer wrote, God's wrath in the Bible is never the capricious, self-indulgent, irritable, morally ignoble thing that human anger so often is. It is instead a right and necessary reaction to objective moral evil. Now, you've all known me long enough to know I'm not a fire and brimstone preacher. I was ultimately won to Christ by the realization of the love of God, and that's always been a major emphasis of my preaching and teaching every area of my ministry. However, we don't want to do that to the extent that we overlook the holiness of God. And so often in our world today, we ignore this. We present a worldview of God that's kind of like a doting old grandfather sitting on the front porch just approving of us, whatever we say or whatever we do. And that's because our culture has worked very hard to erase the idea of morals. They've worked very hard to erase the idea of sin. And more and more, we have become the if it feels good, it must be okay with God generation. More and more, we've become the God just wants me to be happy generation. Almost any and all sins can now be justified by a people and a culture that has subscribed to this way of thinking. If I enjoy it, how can it be wrong? If I enjoy it, how can God ever hold it against me? He just wants me to be happy. I hear that all the time. And yet the Bible never presents a God like that. The Bible consistently presents a God who has established moral right and moral wrong. He's established what is sin and what is purity. And he calls us to reject everything he calls sin, and he calls us to embrace everything he calls purity. The Bible is clear that this God of ours, he hates sin. He doesn't hate sinners, but he hates sin. He most definitely hates sin. He hates what sin does to the people he loves. And the day of God's wrath against sin is coming. All sin will one day be destroyed. And if we are people who embrace, if we choose to embrace sin, despite repeated warnings and incredible patience by God, then one day we will experience the wrath of God as well willingly intertwined with our sin, when that sin is fully judged by the holiness of God, we will be judged by God's consuming fire as well. Scripture's clear. Neither sin nor people who willingly embrace sin are allowed in God's eternal kingdom. This truth presented in Scripture over and over and over and over and over and over again is unmistakable. And so all that brings me to kind of my big point tonight. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord, the Bible says. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And the prophet Isaiah reminds us in Isaiah 59 too, God speaking, he says, Your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God, and your sins have made him hide his face from you so that he does not listen. Psalm 24 likewise says, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? That's the question. Here's the answer. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not set his mind on what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And so the Bible is clear. It is ultimately only the holy people who will see the holy God. Unholy people will never lay eyes on him. So when we hear that, we say, man, well, what hope do we have? 
Because I'll just confess to you tonight, God is holy. I am not. I'm better than I used to be, but I still have so far to go. I'm not even close. Fundamentally, essentially, by nature and by choice, I'm, I'm still a sinner. I, I sin less now than I did 20 years ago, but I'm still not perfect. I'm pursuing holiness in my life, but I'm still not holy myself. My hands aren't clean. My heart isn't pure. Sometimes I still offer up my time and my energy to be entertained by things I know are based on the pursuit of the flesh, on the patterns of this world. I know that I will never, on my own holiness, ascend the mountain of the Lord to the holy heights where God dwells. I still daily stumble and fall in my attempts to be holy, in my attempts to live a holy life that always honors God. 1 Peter makes this uh, clear to us in 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. Peter says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your, holy, of your former ignorance, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. So it's, it's tough to interpret that any other way. God commands us. God calls us. He gives us a kaleo to be holy in all our conduct because he is holy. I, I hear that calling. I want to be holy. But so far, my life is not yet perfectly holy. My heart is still sometimes attracted to sin. My mind still sometimes tries to justify sin. I am a living contradiction sometimes to God's holy character, and God sees it all. I am caught red-handed, and so are you. Our sin not only makes us totally incompatible with our holy, holy, holy God, it makes us guilty of treason against Him. We've broken his law. We've defied his commands. We've fallen short of his glory. We've trespassed in forbidden territory. We, we've missed the bullseye of perfection required by our holy God. We deserve death. We deserve eternal separation from our holy God. The Apostle Paul, he could relate to this. He writes in Romans 7, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. In other words, he deserves what the law says he deserves. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. He says, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, uh, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Oh, what a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Can any of you relate? Boy, I, I can. A constant war rages between the desire to do right, the desire to live a perfectly holy life, and the desire to indulge the flesh, the desire to follow my way instead of God's ways. As he confesses his lack of holiness, Paul cries out, What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this? It's a cry of hopelessness. But then immediately he gives the answer, and it's full of hope. He says, well, who will rescue me from this? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. What feels 
hopeless actually has hope. God will rescue me from this state that I've put myself in through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the good news of the gospel. Here's what Christianity offers us. Thankfully, what God's holiness demanded, His grace also provided through Jesus. Jesus stepped in and He took the white-hot heat of God's eternal and holy revulsion to sin. He became our sin on that cross on Calvary so that all who put their hope in Him will never be put to shame. And on the cross, Jesus and I, we traded sin natures. He became my sin, and He allowed me to become His holiness. So imperfect as I am, I now stand before God in a righteousness, in a holiness that is not my own. I have been granted, forgiven, accepted, holy sonship with all its privileges, all because God the Father sent His Son, Jesus, to take the punishment for sin for my sin, for your sin, so that if we will place our faith in Christ, if we accept His way, if we follow Christ, He fills in all the blanks of where we fall short in our pursuit of holiness. That's great news for all of us because we all fall short. Romans 3 reminds us of this. This righteousness is given how? Through faith in Jesus Christ to who? All who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. He paid for all of our sins, all of our mistakes, all of our crimes. Jesus paid the price. How? Through the shedding of His blood. How do we receive it? Through faith. The Apostle Paul also points out in Romans 5 that as we stumble and struggle in our attempts to live holy lives in Jesus' name, God shows us more grace and more mercy. He's patient with us. He doesn't immediately punish us for our recurring sins, for our repeated falling short of the glory of God. So what do we do with all that? What does all that mean? Paul asks. Since Jesus has fulfilled the requirement of God's holiness in us, well then, are we then free to go commit all the sins we want to our heart's content without any fear of reprisal or punishment or wrath from God? Have we found some kind of great spiritual loophole that allows us to live as though we have no relationship with Jesus, as if we have no responsibility to be holy as He is holy? Can we just go out and sin our brains out as much as we want? Well, some new Christians that the Apostle Paul encountered, they were trying to make this very point. They were essentially saying, hey, sinning's okay with God. Sin all we want because God will forgive all of it. God just wants us to be happy. And so the more we sin, the more we get to experience God's grace. So if you really want to experience God's grace, sin your brains out. Keep on sinning so God will show you even more grace. And Paul was absolutely disgusted by this idea. Here's part of his response in Romans 6. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. Who are those who have died? We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Here's another part of Paul's answer in Galatians 6. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please God, whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. In other words, when God points out a sin in your life, when you become aware of some aspect of your nature that is unholy, when you become aware of some aspect of your nature that is displeasing to God, and He gives you a kaleo, He gives you a calling to change it, to repent of that sinful behavior, 
then you have a new responsibility to obey and to repent because we are supposed to live a holy life because he is holy. And yes, sometimes we mess up, but when we become aware of what we're doing and God convicts us of that, the answer is obvious. Repent and do what is holy. A life that is uniquely set apart for the glory of God and a life that is pure and without sin. That's what we're called to pursue. If we're truly going to be followers of Christ, not just by name, but by deed, then we have to obey, we have to repent, we have to pursue holiness as much as we possibly can. Knowing we will never on our own ability reach holiness doesn't change the fact that holiness is what we're supposed to pursue. Pursue holiness. Because God will not be mocked. We reap what we sow. And so when we're truly followers of Jesus Christ, the proof is in our actions. We do what Jesus would do. We act how Jesus would act. We speak how Jesus would speak. We treat other people the way Jesus treated other people. We treat God the way Jesus treated the Father. We obey God. We reject sin. We do our best to live holy lives just as our master led a perfect, holy life. Now, again, like I said, God knows we're not going to do a perfect job of that. We're not perfect. We're, we're not going to reach perfect holiness in this life. If we could, then Jesus wouldn't have needed to come. Jesus wouldn't have needed to do what he did. Yet, living a life of perfect holiness should still be our constant focus, our continual effort, our constant goal. We're called to be holy as he is holy. We're called to do our very best, our very best with the hope and the trust that Jesus will fill in the blanks where we fall short. Daily, daily, we should be a little more holy than we were yesterday. And tomorrow, we should be a little more holy than we were today. So let me wrap it up tonight. I'm going to ask a very serious question tonight. Is there anything that the Word of God calls us in? Is there anything that the Word of God says is unholy that you're still practicing in your life right now? Let me ask that again. Is there anything that the Word of God calls a sin? Is there anything that the Word of God calls unholy that you are still practicing in your life right now? And it may be something you really enjoy. It may be something you love. It may feel fantastic to keep doing it. You don't want to give it up. You don't want to stop doing it. Paul reminds us that is the destructive nature of sin. Like any other addiction, it deceives us. It convinces us that it's worth whatever it costs us, even if what it costs us is eternal life in the presence of God, because only the holy get to see the holy God. And so God is giving us all a kaleo, today. God is giving us a calling to obey him, to leave our life of sin, to repent of every behavior he convicts us of that he calls sin. Because we've been seriously deceived by our culture. We've been seriously deceived by some preachers who tickle our ears, tickle our itching ears, and say what we want to hear. We've been told that we can call Jesus Lord and not obey what he t says to do. And Jesus was clear. We talked about this when we were doing the Sermon on the Mount, right? Calling Jesus the Lord and Savior of our life isn't enough. He demands more than lip service. He said in the Sermon on the Mount, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
but only who? The one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. In the Sermon on the Plain, he said something similar. Why do you call me Lord and not do what I tell you to do? Who will enter the kingdom of heaven? Only the ones who do the will of God. That's what Jesus says in multiple places in Scripture. Who will see the Holy One? Only those who are holy. Going to a weekly confession? That's not a get-out-of-hell-free card. Saying a sinner's prayer? That's not a get-out-of-hell-free card. It's not a license to continue in sin without fearing any consequences. Let's sin all the more so God's grace will abound all the more. No. We are called to be true followers of Christ, the ones who actually do the will of our Father who is in heaven. And that means we are to pursue holiness. We might not always hit the mark, we might fall short, but we should at least be pursuing holiness, trusting Jesus to fill in where we do fall short in every area of our life. Reject sin when we become aware, when we become convicted. Flee from sin when we become aware, when we become convicted. Do our very best to live holy lives. Do our very best to trust Christ to fill in with his grace where we do fall short. But still, we should pursue holiness with everything we have. Singer-songwriter David Crowder wrote about this desire to be holy, holy. Joel sang one of uh, David's songs as we closed our worship time earlier. Here's a different song of David. I just want to sing part of this chorus for you. He says, I am full of earth. You are heaven's worth. I am stained with dirt, prone to depravity. And you are everything that is bright and clean. The antonym of me, you are divinity. But a certain sign of grace is this. From the broken earth, Flowers come up, pushing through the dirt, and you are holy, holy, holy. All heaven cries, holy, holy God. And you are holy, holy, holy. I want to be holy like you are. As Joel comes, let's pray together. Father God, this is a tall order. This is a challenging command. Be holy as I am holy, you said. We're called to be holy. Even though we know we're incapable of truly being 100% holy, holy on our own power. But you've given us the answer to that dilemma. And his name is Jesus. When we put all the pieces together, when we say, oh yeah, context is everything. All the context of Scripture together says, I can't be perfect. I can't be holy as you are holy, and yet I'm commanded to be holy as you are holy. How can I reconcile that? How can I do it? When we put all the pieces together, it's clear. I'm to pursue holiness. Do my very best every day to be holy. Not to just say, well, I can't be holy, so I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to go live my life, and Jesus will fill in the blanks. No, I'm to pursue holiness. Every time I'm convicted of a sin, stop, confess, repent, pursue holiness. Every time, pursue holiness with the goal that tomorrow I'm going to be a little more holy than I was yesterday and the next day I'm going to be a little more holy than I was the day before and I still won't even be remotely close to being holy on my own 
that's where Jesus comes in. And that's why the second part of the equation is I have to put my faith and trust in Jesus. I have to accept and receive what he did for me on the cross where he offered to trade sin natures. He did live a holy, perfect life. And he said, you know what? I'll give you credit for that if you follow me. If you follow me. I'm not just going to give it to you for nothing. You've got to be part of my plan. You've got to follow me. Why do you call me Lord if you're not going to do what I tell you to do? Not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father. And he knows you're not going to do the will of his Father 100% of the time exactly right you're going to stumble you're going to fall you're going to make mistakes you're not going to be holy on your own but you've got to pursue holiness we have to try to do our best to be holy and as we do that as we follow jesus as we trust jesus that's where his grace comes in that's where he fills in the blanks that's where his holiness fills in all the cracks and we are presented as holy and righteous before God and we do get to enter the kingdom of heaven and we do get to see God and we do get to live in eternity with him not because of anything we've done but because of what Jesus has done our part pursue holiness knowing we'll reap what we sow do the best we can, knowing it's not enough, knowing it will fall short, but do the best we can. And Jesus fills in the rest. God, I pray for anyone watching tonight who's never begun a relationship with Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that tonight would be that night to say, I get it now. I confess I am not holy. I am full of depravity. O wretched man that I am, O wretched woman that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? All of these sinful choices, all of these bad decisions I make on a regular basis, how can I be rescued from that? And the answer is Jesus. Jesus loves you so much. He went to the cross and he became all of your sins. He died on the cross in your place to give you a second chance so that you would have the chance to pursue holiness as you follow Him. So just say to Him today, Jesus, thank You for dying on the cross for me. Thank You for offering me Your holiness to cover my lack. And I want to obey You. I want to follow You. I want to pursue holiness. I want You to be the Lord, the God of my life. You lead, I'll follow You tell me what to do, that's what I'll do. You tell me what to say, that's what I'll say. You tell me what to think, and that's what I'll think, Jesus. I trust you as my God, my creator, my Lord. Be the Lord of my life. And thank you for being the Savior of my life, the one who makes it possible for me to avoid avoid eternal separation from God, the one who makes it possible for me to be saved from the mess I got myself into and ushered instead into eternal life with God. The one who saves me from the wrath of God by taking the wrath of God for me on the cross. Jesus, be the Lord and Savior of my life. If that's the prayer of your heart tonight, you can say, me too, God, me too. What Pastor G just prayed, that's what I want. I want that relationship with Jesus, and I want to do what he tells me to do. I want to pursue holiness trusting he'll fill in the blanks wherever I fall short. Me too, God. Me too. And if you prayed that kind of prayer for the very first time tonight, do me a favor and send me an email and tell me. Send it to Pastor Greg Scott at gmail.com. Pastor Greg Scott at gmail.com. And say, Greg, I just became a follower of Jesus. What do I do next? What's the next step? I'll be happy to help you. God bless you. Thanks for being with us. I hope you'll join us Sunday morning for a message of thanks, thanksgiving, a message of thankfulness and gratitude. Let's turn things back to Joel. Aloha. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open all my eyes to the things on the scene. Show me how to love like you. Love me. Break my heart. Break my heart for what breaks your 
guys, the Romans had some really brutal punishments in their law. Some arguably even more brutal than the cross that's standing behind me. And one of them was referenced in, in the scripture that Greg shared with us tonight from Romans. The body of death was something that in that time people knew what it was. The idea was if a person committed murder and killed a person, they would then take and strap that person head to toe, nose to nose, bound inextricably with that person that they killed. And if anyone removed the binds and freed them from that body of death, then that person would have to take for them. And I'm so grateful that we're in a church and in a place where we can hear the good news, where we can receive the hope, the truth, the true gospel message without a hint of judgment or Show us what that means. Hold our hand in that journey. We love you. We praise you tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Aloha.